Hello, everyone. I'm Joseph Bricker, director of the R Consortium, and I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to introduce Robert Gentleman, our next keynote speaker. Most of you know that along with Ross Ihaka, Robert created the R language. You may not know that after that, Robert embarked on a career as a computational scientist holding leadership positions at several prominent institutions, including Harvard University, the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, the Fred Hutchison Cancer Research Center, Genentech, and 23andMe. Recently, Robert is back at Harvard, where he has been appointed founding executive director of the Harvard Medical School Center for Computational Biomedicine, with a mission, as described in the Harvard press release, to, quote, conceptualize the scientific vision for computational biomedicine across HMS, end quote. It would take a Wikipedia page to do justice to Robert's accomplishments. Here, I would just like to mention that while pursuing his extraordinary career, Robert has continued to be a passionate open source champion and community builder. Much of what we now take for granted in the R world including the R Core Group, the Culture of Cooperation, the Bioconductor Project, and the R Consortium may very well not have happened without Robert's vision, support, and personal touch. Please virtually welcome Robert into your homes and offices for a view into the future. Robert. Great, thanks a lot, Joe, and uh, thank you to everybody who's coming. Um, as Joe said, I just uh, very recently uh, switched jobs, um, and I have taken a new position at Harvard in the medical school. Um, it is my first uh, sort of foray into that, and I didn't know when I accepted the, the invitation that I would actually be sort of more on the medical side and less on the pharma side. Um, and it has sort of unfortunately caught me in between jobs when and when you leave in the industry, it's really hard to take your work with you. So um, what I ha have put together for you today is, you know, some of the ideas that um, I'm hoping to sort of start to develop some observations and things that I think are really important for how we are going to bring computation, computational science into uh, the practice of medicine. Um, and that is you know, largely what I'm hoping to do at, at Harvard. Um, and maybe a, a way to conceptualize it and how, how I think about it a little bit is that um, with with our, I was involved with a fantastic group of people and we built a tool that's just sort of broadly useful for everybody. It doesn't matter what it, uh, sort of area of, of science or, or, or pretty much anything else you are working on. If you need to do computation, then, you know, R can be a, a vehicle for you to do that. And then when I was at uh, Harvard the first time in the School of Public Health, uh, as Joe said, you know, I worked again with a di slightly different but a little overlapping group of people to set up the bioconductor project. And there, what we tried to do was to really say, you know, what happens if you move into a discipline and say, what we'll, we're going to do as a group is, you know, agree on data structures. And it turns out if you agree on data structures, then it's much easier to set, share code and algorithms than if you don't agree on data structures. But, you know, if we build that infrastructure, will people come? And, and by and large, that too has turned out to be a, a, a true statement. And then as I went on through the Hutch and, and Genentech and, and 23andMe, what I found was that for institutions or organizations to succeed as units, there is a need for a very large sort of piece of data infrastructure that lives in the middle. And so today I'm going to talk a lot about that and why I think that's really is essential for the future of computation in medicine. And I hope uh, by the end of the talk, I've convinced you that there are some, you know, very interesting problems and big opportunities here um, that are, as I said, centered around how do we put together infrastructure that supports, you know, institutions or organizations um, that that have sort of shared needs and goals. Um, so what's what's the future going to look like and in, in sort of where do we think computation will come in? And so, you know, and I think of seen a few talks here and elsewhere, right? It's really unlikely that most doctors are going to use R or any other computer language directly in their practice. 
But what is highly likely is that doctors will rely more and more on algorithms to guide care and lifestyle decisions. Um, so sort of wellness opportunities for their patients. And in order to use those algorithms, we're going to need uh, very large databases of well curated data that will help to support those decisions. And, and I do think that the well curated part is, is absolutely essential to this and, and even more essential to the problem of developing new algorithms and new methods. So I, I'm not a believer that, you know, just a big database that you sort of search through and find interesting facts where it has little curation and not much annotation is unlikely to be uh, the, the resource that gets us very far in medicine. I, I could well be wrong about that. And there are certainly people with a different opinion on that. And in order to do things, they're going to need a whole bunch of different inputs. Though some of those inputs will come from things that we're starting to use already, like smart watches, some way of getting at food consumption and the variety that, of foods that people eat. And you know, th these turn out to be really important facts for understanding wellness and sort of general health, but they're poorly collected in general. And if we don't have the data, we can't use the data in order to help make those predictions. And if the, you know, the information that you need is how much you exercise or how much fiber you need, that's the biggest you know, sort of lever for understanding risk for a disease, then absent that data, we're not going to get there. Genetics, which I've spent the last five years uh, learning a lot about, and there'll be a fair amount of that in, in the talk today, and genomics are going to come in. I think they're reasonably straightforward. We are close to doing them at the scale they need to be done. Um, and then, you know, the, the other sorts of pieces of information like medical history, current health status, your blood values, etc. But I do sort of want to push a little bit in this talk. You know, it's not going to be, is it EHRs or self-reported data? It's going to be both of those. You have to have inputs on, you know, activity and food and risk, etc. to be able to make algorithms that are highly predictive because for certain diseases, it's lifestyle that beats everything else. If we're going to rely on algorithms in our medical practice, then there are some things that we absolutely have to do, and that is to have these large, well-curated data sets in which the algorithms have been trained and tested. And the data sets have to be comprehensive, and they have to cover the range of patients, diseases, and exposures likely to be seen in practice. And I know there is a new sort of thing out there of, oh, machine learning has bias, but it's not, not really the bias. It's the fact that you're trying to use a machine learning algorithm on an input that has never been seen before. And that, you know, should be something that we catch earlier and sort of, you know, in some sense, it would be better if algorithm said, hey, this doesn't look like data that I've ever seen before, and I'm not going to give you an answer. And sadly, many of them are implemented as I'll give you the best answer I can, even though the data that came in is a long way from any of the data that was ever trained on. And we'll see some real world examples here where that has turned out quite bad for at least a, a range of, of people. Um, the instruments that are being used by the clinician need to have near real-time access to these appropriate data resources. It doesn't have to be quite real-time because the doctor doesn't have to sort of fill in the risk information at the minute you come into their office. If it's a regular checkup, they could have that pre-populated and have time to do it. But if this is going to get used in ERs or any place where you don't have time to realize that you're actually going to uh, require emergency services and pre-populate these things, we'll, we'll need to make sure that the resources are there and fast enough and available enough. And then most of what I'll do here is sort of give you some ideas of things that I think will happen in the near future. Many of them are already underway, and they're, they're certainly not my ideas. Uh, other people have been expressing these, and I'm just going to try to sort of lay out where they are. And then wh what has to happen if we're actually going to get these into the clinic? And that seems to be a place where, at least in most of my conversations, there are big gaps in what people think is possible um, and, and probable. And I'll try to, to give a bit of guidance on what I think the is needed. In genetics, the most important uh, formula is genotype plus environment equals phenotype. And mostly what we can do here is just think of, you know, phenotype is really wellness. How fit are you? Do you have a disease of some sort? Are you at risk for that disease, etc.? Those are our phenotypes. And so if we want to predict phenotypes from data, the data has to have genotypes and environmental data. 
that data consists of things like exposures, behaviors, um, and, and other things. Um, and you know, as I said a little bit earlier, I think genotyping is the easiest problem to solve. We can talk about that. Environmental data at scale is harder and doesn't reside in the single location, or at least it doesn't now, and we'll need to, if not have it in one location, we'll certainly have to have it in places that are easily accessible from a single uh, you know, sort of doctor's office. Um, one thing I found at 23andMe is if you want to get phenotype data on people at scale in you know the 10 million, 100 million things, it's not going to come from EHRs or EMRs because there's no set of hospitals that use exactly the same system that have you know on the order of 100 million patients. That's just not not going to happen. But we can set up a survey and send it to 100 million people and get relatively uniform data back. And then for a lot of the environmental data, that's really going to be the only option you have. There, there aren't other ones that I'm aware of. Continuous measurements are great, um, but they're expensive. You're going to store a lot of data. And if you only want a small part of it, um, then it's better to you know, get everything from a group of people, figure out what the important number is, and then from the whole population, even though you could have a vast amount of data, you can sort of resolve that down to a relatively small number of, of inputs that you'll need. And then improvements as we go forward in machine learning, and, and you know, again, there are lots of people talking about these, they're just going to help us build better and more interpretable and actual models. All right, so just a little short discretion, a digression on exposure. So one of the places that we really lack good exposure is lifetime exposure. Um, and those of you with your cameras on can see that I'm getting a little bit older and, and uh, hopefully a little bit wiser, but mostly older. And so diseases of aging start to make me uh, sort of want to study them. Um, and it turns out we have a reasonably good idea of how to establish lifetime exposure to smoking, right? Pack years has been studied for quite a long time, and at least in most people's hands, it does a reasonably good job. We don't have good estimates of lifetime exposure to alcohol, and we don't even know if that's important or not. We don't know whether it's how much did you drink in the last few weeks that puts you at risk for a disease, or is it really this lifetime exposure? Exactly the same thing for exercise, fiber, and so on. So there are lots of things that we know it, it matters more how you behaved over your whole lifetime than it does how you behaved last week. And EMRs, EHRs, and even self-report are very challenged for us to get that kind of information. So an area where I think there's a lot of room for uh, improvements in data collection and just in understanding how to, to do things is in this sort of lifetime exposure, which will, I think, ultimately be essential to get good models. And then, of course, in lots of these things, causation is almost impossible to establish. It's very hard to get the, the right sort of experiment out of things. So we're going to be stuck with things that are more observational. And, you know, a simple example is when you look at will, wellness, we know that elderly folks that socialize a lot tend to be healthier than the ones that don't. But we don't know whether it's the socializing that helps them become, you know, keeps them well, or the fact that they're well that allows them to socialize. And causation would be nice because once you have causal relationships, then it's easier to understand and interpret the models. And that's in, in some sense where genetics, again, sort of wins out a little bit for folks that aren't, aren't aware of it. You know, genetics is essentially causal. You have the genotype at birth, so everything else has to be after that. Your exposures can't really cause your genotype. All right, so genetics, I believe, will be uh, playing an increasingly important role in medical care. Um, it's uh, often prioritized by risk. Uh, so whether, whether you get genotypes, and we'll see some examples. So for example, getting genotype for a, a BRCA mutation um, you know, is an expensive operation. It's not routinely carried out. It does tend to be routinely carried out in people at high risk, um, but that's you know basically a cost issue. So does, is, can we make the cost benefit work out? And then the observation that most of these alleles, you know, BRCA mutations are really quite rare, rare in the population. So if we sequenced everybody, we do an awful lot of sequencing at high price and get relatively few individuals that we could, you know, sort of provide a benefit. But the thing that's not always being considered in that is that, you know, we can now genotype individuals at a very, very low cost. It's, you know, in the, in the range of $100 a person, you use a microarray, you get, you know, uh, genotypes at a backbone of about three quarters of a million variants. And then you use a process called imputation. Um, 
which is reasonably cheap again. Um, and so, you know, around a total cost of ownership of about a hundred bucks, you get 40 million plus variants that have been reliably imputed. And if you wanted other variants, if you had some variants that you specifically wanted to uh, impute better and you knew that they were in the population at some uh, frequency, you can sequence a small number of individuals and then you'll start to impute those variants really well as well. So it's it's very uh, amazing tool and it, and it works quite well. Um, if we did that, then at birth, you would know all of these pharmacogenomic variants, you'd know adverse uh, drug event variants, you'd know variants for some of the rarer diseases. And we could also, and I'll talk about these later, then given uh, polygenic risk scores, which, which are reasonably easy to develop um, for thousands of diseases, you, you essentially could at birth be, you know, sort of given this piece of information into your medical record that said, you know, here's the drugs that you probably want to be really careful with because you'll have an adverse event. These are the diseases that you're most at genetic risk for. Um, and at some point when the data catch up, because getting the gene by environment interactions is going to be the hardest part. We don't measure the environment as well as we want. And any interaction estimation requires larger data sets than main effects, um, as all, all the statisticians in the audience know. Um, so this is going to come along a bit later. But we can today tell people an awful lot about what they're at risk for at birth, right? So once they're born, you genotype them, and then you know an awful lot about what the risks are going forward. And, you know, as I said, in 20 years, I fully anticipate we will then be able to start telling people things like, you know, this kind of exercise is good for you. This kind of diet is good for you. This kind of diet might be really bad for you, etc. So maybe just a little divergence into the human genome. Again, most people probably know this. There's about three and a half billion nucleotides. We sequence it and attempt to measure it at every location. That cost is still in the thousand dollar range. Uh, you can get it down a little bit, um, but for medical uh, level genetics, it's probably close to that. And then the cost of owning that, these whole genome sequences are actually very large. We don't store them as efficiently as we could. And so you're, you know, you're then looking at you know, another $1,500. Whereas for um, uh, genotyping, it's much, much less than that. And so it really does turn out to be pretty cost effective. So we have 22 autosomes and then uh, the sex chromosomes. As again, most people know, women have two copies of X and men have one copy of X and one copy of Y. Um, and variants in this uh, variation in the sequence uh, of the genome is actually associated with human disease. And that's what we do when we study GWASs. And I'll show you some examples in, in a little bit. Um, it is very hard in general to go from a variant in the genome that associates with the disease to knowing exactly what gene and what happens to that gene and how that thing causes the disease. That's something called the fine mapping problem. And that is what most pharma, certainly what I did at 23 and me and a little bit of what I did at Genentech, but almost all pharma is obsessed with trying to find solutions to this fine mapping problem, because that's the way that you find drug targets. Once you have a target, then you start to develop the therapeutic against that target. The reason that, um, uh, sort of imputation, this idea that I only have to measure your genome on a, a fairly limited set of places and then I can sort of fill in the values in between by this process called imputation is really because of, of this sort of notion of crossing over. So while you get half of your DNA from mom and half from dad, it's very rare that any chromosome in your body is actually the same as a chromosome in either of your parents because in a sort of making the egg and the sperm, they, there's this sort of recombinant crossing over and it's, uh, I think it's three to five crossovers, uh, two to three crossovers per chromosome, per meiosis. So each of your chromosomes, it looks like the ones that your mom has, but it'll be part of one, like she has two copies, it'll be part of one and part of another one that are sort of stuck together. Um, but that means DNA travels in, in clumps, right? You have long sequences, right, of, of DNA that go together and that the changes in those are not that rapid across the population. So if I see some markers in one individual and I see exactly the same markers in another individual, it's very likely that the pieces in between are identical as well. And we can, we can actually estimate that. We can uh, do the predictions and, and not, not only fit the models reasonably well, but know when we're not fitting them well and know, uh, you know exactly what you need to know, which is, hey, this imputation didn't work very well and we shouldn't be relying on it. 
complications and we'll see them as they come up in a bit. So I just want to introduce this so you know about it. This thing called linkage disequilibrium. That says there's a strong association between new two nearby variants. Essentially, if I know one of them, I know the other. And in a statistical sense, this just causes confounding and it makes it hard to identify the likely causal variant because there could be in all of the cases for a, a particular disease, if they're, if it's genetic, they may all have a, the same fairly long piece of DNA that they've shared, that they've inherited from a, an, an ancestor. And they will be identical at every variant along that. So you can't say it's this variant or some other one. You have to test every one of them uh, individually to try to understand which one is the likely causal variant. And that's part of what makes it really hard to say, here's a location in the genome that associates with the disease. And I know this variant is, is the causal one because it doesn't have to be. It could be anything that is in linkage disequilibrium with that. Um, other challenges, we don't have a perfect reference yet, as, as I'm sure everybody knows. There's lots of variation that hasn't been accounted for. We really don't deal with structural variation at all well. We don't uh, deal with the sort of uh, you know, uh, trinucleotide repeat sequences particularly well, and many of those associate with diseases as well as the transposable elements. Again, very challenging to do. The other thing that we need in genetics is this, this thing called phasing. So while you have two copies of each chromosome, when we sequence them or, or genotype them, those two sort of get mushed together. And the algorithms are getting much better at being able to take that data and come out and say, one of your chromosomes has this sequence all the way along it, and the other one has that sequence. And again, this is really important because it may be essential that you have two variants on the same strand of a chromosome to get the defect. Um, and if one is on one chromosome and the other is on the other uh, chromosome that you have, you may not actually have the defect. So if we looked at it, we need to know how to phase those people to understand your risk. Um, what does this get used for these days? Um, testing for variants that affect drug efficacy or that cause uh, adverse events. I'll come to those. Testing for rare variants that are highly pathogenic and highly penetrant. So the BRCAs, familial hypercholesteremia, G6PD, which I'll talk about, Huntington's, Huntington's disease. Um, and often uh, here, as I said before, you sequence the implicated genes and then try to interpret the variants that you find. But you can't always. If you show up with a BRCA mutation that nobody's ever seen before, nobody knows, they, they can't say, yes, this is likely to cause disease. They would have to then either do some biochemistry to get at that or wait until they get more people with the same mutation and say, oh, look, most of the people with this mutation did get breast cancer. So we seem to think it will be pathogenic. Um, companies are starting to move this into the direct to consumer market and I'll show you some data from them as well. Um, so here's a drug efficacy one, uh, known set of variants that are associated with that, a gene called CYP2C19. Uh, One of these alleles is known to associate with reduced uh, uh, effect of a drug called clopidogrel. Um, and in fact, just a, about two weeks ago, the FDA finally uh, announced a clearance for 23andMe to include this in their, their pharmacogenomics report. And the most important thing of this is that the labeling has been modified so that it doesn't need confirmatory testing. So now if you were a customer of that company, you'd be able to use that genotype that you got off of the array that you purchased potentially for ancestry or other things actually as a, a basis for getting the dose of this drug uh, set up properly. And we'll see more of this as we go forward, as the FDA becomes more comfortable that people can take this data and move forward. The, the, the costs then drop very dramatically as I alluded to earlier, and we can start to see how genetics can sort of play out more. Here I'm showing you uh, G6PD uh, deficiency. This is X-linked, so on the X chromosome. Uh, if you have a variant in this gene, um, then basically you'll have a, a deficiency. Um, and what happens is that for certain drugs, and if you eat fava beans, you can have a life-threatening reaction. And if you look down here at the, the, the bottom, hopefully people can see my mouse moving around a little bit. Um, it's not very prominent in Europeans. And I did a, a little bit of math to say, well, if, if, if we were looking at the US, it'd be about 45,000 European ancestry people in, the Amer in America that a men would be, that would have a uh, risk for this, which is not very many. And you can see why it doesn't make sense to test everybody for it. But as soon as you look at African-Americans, you now see that it's about a 15% allele in the African-American population. And then testing is really valuable. And so this you know, sort of really shows you that there's a 
wide range of variants of the risk alleles across populations. If we then go a little bit further, and a new uh, variant has uh, shown up this last month in, in 23andMe's report, and now this variant actually is much more interesting to people who are Middle Eastern, Middle Eastern or South Asian, and the allele frequency in Europeans and Africans is very low, unlikely to be uh, to benefit from widespread testing. But uh, we now know that uh, you know these, these data can be shared more broadly. Um, and then a recent paper from uh, a, a group at Harvard in the medical school, Arjun Manray. Uh, basically, they looked at uh, misdiagnosis for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, and, you know, again, the, the result section here is kind of surprising, uh, you know, where we got to. But the mutations that were most common in the general population were significantly more common in black Americans than among white Americans. And we would not have misdiagnosed those people if they'd included even a small number of black Americans in the control cohorts. Misclassification here was actually quite bad because it resulted in treatment that the, the patient didn't actually need. So again, we, we, we do need to get better at getting genetics broad across people. And what happened there is basically this linkage disequilibrium problem. So in Europeans, we saw a variant and people said, oh, that must be the one. We, we, think, we think that's the causal variant. But if they looked at Africans, they would have seen that they couldn't have been because the one thing that you, you sort of do is say, well, if I have a rare disease and you're going to tell me this SNP is causal for that rare disease, then the frequency of the SNP in the population has to be less than the frequency of the disease. And so in that case, that didn't work, right? Africans had a very high frequency of that SNP, but they had, didn't have a higher frequency of the disease, certainly not sufficiently high for that SNP to be causal. All right, so let me skip to polygenic risk score. So these are basically weighted sums of the estimated effects of all the risk alleles. So we'll show you a picture in a second and try to bring you along. Much of the focus here has been on individual diseases. As I said earlier, once we have, you know, a thousand polygenic risk scores, you'll be able to get which, which diseases you're most at risk for. And again, I think that's a useful fact to, to help people with um, from, from a genetic perspective. That's not all of your risk, of course. So here is a picture on the left side of uh, a Manhattan plot. So this is basically the, the a visualization of the test of association for variation at that at a particular locus in the genome, right, uh, across all of these. And in this case, it's for uh, depression. And so you can see some parts of the genome, uh, larger things indicate stronger association. So there's some variants that are strongly associated, others that are weakly associated, and with a PRS, what you do is basically just start over here at the far left at chromosome one, and you add up the, the it's sort of odds ratios, the estimated effect sizes for the risk allele across all of these things. And that gives you a way to score every individual in the population. So if, if you have a risk allele at that locus, you get the risk score. And then if you have the, the protective allele, then you get a different score. And now for every individual, we can just sum across the whole genome. In this case, I think it again is it's about 40 million or certainly 20 million uh, variants are, are captured here. So we get a pretty good idea of what's going on. Uh, Seth Kathirson at, at uh, MIT and now at, at Verve Therapeutics is one of the, the folks that's really pushed this. Um, and so now uh, what I want to do is just put, push you up to see these uh, sort of pictures. So this first uh, uh, histogram density plot here, this is for each individual in a study population, you fit, find out what the polygenic risk score is, and then you just plot them from the lowest score to the highest score on some value. And then what you do uh, basically is you, you come here and you say, well, for the really high scores, how many of the people there? So if I take all those people and then I go ask, did you actually get this disease? What frequency of people in that group get the disease relative to somebody who has a different risk? And if that's sufficiently high, then that opens the uh, sort of door for us to start to think about, well, maybe we should screen them differently. Maybe we should treat them differently. And, uh, you know, as I've tried to outline here in the far right, here what's, what you see, this is a pretty common plot here. We just take the percentile of the risk score, and for each percentile, we plot the average of, uh, you know, the, the number of cases for individuals with that score divided by the total number. So just telling you essentially what the, the risk is in each of those. And you can see that as you get to high score, your risk for or the prevalence of cardiovascular disease in those people is very, very high. 
And so that tells us we can go back and, and do things. And then here I just outlined that people are starting to look at how do we do performance in diverse human populations, but our big problem is we don't have that many African genomes, we don't have that many South Asian genomes, and as a result, we're not able to always, you know, extend these models the way that we want. In, in another paper from uh, the same group, um, they basically just, you know, sort of demonstrate here, maybe I'll just focus on this uh, image down here at the bottom. Um, if you just look for monogenic drivers for risk, you find, you know, for these genes, it's about one in 211 people. For these genes, it's about one in 115, right? So we're just gonna do the monogenic stuff. We're in the one in 100, one in 200 range. As soon as we go to a polygenic risk score, we seem to be able to get ourselves into a one in five that have a twofold uh, increased risk for cardiovascular disease. We'd like it to be, you know, three or four fold. So there's work to be done there. Um, but you can see how this really changes the game quite substantially. So it's great to look for individual drivers. I think that's a worthwhile exercise, but it doesn't impact that many people. It's better to start adding in polygenic risk, which is both, you know, here it's really talking now about genetic risk, but eventually we want to bring in phenotypes because for many diseases, phenotype matters far more than, than genotype. We want to make sure we're getting a good estimate of risk. But hopefully this gives you an idea of, of what the opportunities are in, in this particular space and why I think it's important and, and why I think you'll see it coming into hospitals and treatment in the nearish future. Okay. So now what, I, what I've done is sort of say, here's a whole bunch of things that you could kind of do. And I have a couple more examples around single cell and some of the imaging data, but it's the same idea. We can generate large data sets. We know they're informative about you know, the state of the patient. We think they might actually be informative about what treatment should you give that person. But how do we get to that, right? Because the data themselves don't tell you what to do. We need algorithms and we need to, 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 to be able to get training data sets that are sufficiently large and sufficiently general to be able to do that. And that turns out to be really expensive, right? So in my time at, at uh, you know, basically, again, m most of Harvard, the Hutch, Genentech, et cetera, there are lots and lots of AI ML solutions that come along all the time. In general, the problem is not finding a new algorithm. That is not what has slowed the, the field down at all. And it's not finding interesting problems, as I've already outlined here. There's a ton of them that could be worked on. The problem, the biggest challenge is how do we get large, well-annotated, clinically relevant data sets that can be used to test and train and validate these models? That turns out to be the most challenging and the most expensive part of the whole operation. And so that's the place where I want to try and focus over the next few years most of my efforts. Um, in that, there is it's essential that you're working on a clinically relevant problem. And we'll talk a little bit about how to get there with data that's sufficient to address that problem. And then of course, if you actually want to use your algorithm to change the clinical diagnosis or the clinical path for somebody, well, you better make sure that you have a plan to get clinical validation. So here, what I've tried to outline just in this little flow chart um, is, is you know, the sort of standard typical workflow that would go on in here identify the problem that you want to work on, then find sufficient data, training and testing data that you can use to, to do stuff, identify a, usually a set of AI ML approaches because the standard approach is really, let's try five or six different things because we really don't know which one's going to work well. And then go through this iterative learning and performance optimization until you finally get happy. And now you've got model estimates that you like, you look at those, you basically try to understand how they work and right, there's some stuff to do in that. And then you, if you do want to change clinical practice, you then hit this clinical validation step um, and you're gonna have to say, well, how do I take all of this information and give it back to a, a doctor or put it into a, a medical device in a way that would allow people to make decisions in real time. And then ultimately it gets used. And you know what I've tried to say, at least in my experience, is that identifying the problem, the AI ML piece, and the fitting of the model, these are weeks to months type operations. But the two red boxes can really be months to years. It can be very challenging to get a big enough data set. And as a result, we often see approaches that are published that are were fit on models on data that were too small for us to be able to extend them. They give us hints that the idea works well, but they don't get us 
to the place where you could do clinical validation. And then the, the planning around the clinical validation step is often not included in this. And people get very excited about, you know, doing everything up to the, the fit the model and obtain parameter estimates. Typically that's what gets published in the scientific literature, but there is this big step that we need to overcome if we're really gonna change how, how stuff happens. In doing this, you need a big multidisciplinary team. You need clinicians to ensure clinical relevance, pathologists to help you select the right cases, comp computational scientists, computer vision scientists, to make sure that the thing you're trying to do is even remotely tractable and that you know they believe that you can get enough data, you can process it in finite time and, and yield outputs. You, um, when you want to identify your approaches, again, you need computational science with experience, intuition to identify reasonable approaches, and then try make sure that you try complementary things and, and do all of the, the standard stuff that the machine learning community has, has developed. This creating of these data sets, that's why I said this takes a long time. I'll show you some examples at, 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 at the end here, or at least one example with what I think is a pretty interesting problem. Once you fit the model, then you need, you know, data visualization experts, biostatisticians, et cetera, that help tell you what you learned and what it means, and then clinical scientists that will take those outputs and a brand new cohort that's never been seen before by anybody and say, yeah, this seems, seems to work in this cohort, and this is how well it works. And then finally, after all of that, you still need to have some plan for a trial that will do clinical validation. How do you go out into real world con conditions and show that a clinician that's using the tool that you think they should be using will get results that are similar to those that were done in the lab? And then you can basically develop a, a, this as a lab developed test under CLIA or CAP rules. All right, so that's sort of that part. So let me spend a few minutes, how much am I gonna, five or six minutes here at least, um, talking a little bit about single cell transcriptomics. Um, again, a, a fantastic opportunity um, out there uh, with some hope of changing medical care, certainly understanding diseases. So in oncology, the notion there is we're gonna identify important subsets of the tumor with specific defects and that will help guide treatment. Immunology, um, identifying subsets of the cells of the immune system like NK cells or macrophages, et cetera, that are not performing as anticipated. Um, my own bets are on immunology uh, right now. I think that there's a lot of reason to believe that, that single cell immunology, especially in perturbation type experiments that are going to lead us to insights of how the immune system is dysregulated in disease that will be super valuable. And in part that's because most of the cells of your immune system are quite happy being single cells and you know, basically you don't have to do much to them to get them through these assays. We know a lot of the important chemokines and cytokines that you'd like to do the perturbation experiments on and then see what the, the readouts are. Um, so I think, you know, as I said, I think that'll be easy. I think there's some challenges in oncology still, and I'll outline a couple of them, I think, in the next slide. And then neurobiology is, is really fascinating. How do we study the brain, right, defects associated with neurons, um, uh, de defects in brain-specific immune cells, such as astrocytes. Um, and here, it does seem that, that the field is going to have to move into a world where you're trying to get sequencing data, imaging data, et cetera, so you get changes in behavior in the right context, right? The brain needs to be surrounded or intact and, and in a, the right environment to be able to study most of the, the real uh, things that are going on. So neurobiology, I think, will be fascinating, but harder because we're gonna have to marry at least two technologies to, to get it going. So sampling uh, for all the statisticians, it's always a bit of uh, an oddity to me. Um, you know, we're sampling data from something. So think of a, a tumor, right? Somebody's going to take a biopsy. They're going to take that biopsy and they're going to look at the single cells in it and they're going to say, okay, here's what's going on in the tumor. Um, and hopefully most of you realize that would be remarkably like, you know, somebody going to Iowa asking people what the most important crop is and coming out saying, we know everything about the United States and what the most important crop is. Um, it just doesn't happen that way. And statistics has a long tradition of developing good methods and models and survey sampling. Um, and it's you know, essential that some of these take over. The same will be true in, in immune cells. 
Um, and amongst these, the really big challenges are that it's often the rare populations that are causing the defect and the rare populations are really hard to both sample and to identify. And so, you know, I think there are challenges here that, that have to be overcome. I do think we have statistical methods, but I haven't seen people, you know, sort of put it, putting those two together um, quite the way they need to. Um, and certainly in my experience, tumors are a remarkably diverse. Um, they're not clonal in, in general. They basically evolve and different parts of them evolve in, in different ways, at least in, in many, many tumors. And so I think this is a, a place where, yes, maybe, but there are challenges that won't, won't easily get resolved if we don't address them head on. And then, you know, as I think everybody knows, the issue, one of the issues here is that we really only get a small number of expressed transcripts. It's 10 to 15 percent of your lucky on a, a single cell of, of the mRNA that are actually expressed can get detected. There's certainly goals out there to try to get that better. Um, and, and, you know, it is an engineering problem. So I'm confident of that. Um, and, and even within that, we still only get short transcripts. And again, their goal is to get long transcripts and full length, and those will be important and we'll see them as they come along. And then there's some other options. I'll show you one, one image here at the end um, when I get there. All right, so here's just a, again, a, a, a graphic from a paper, but the idea is, is pretty straightforward. We have back in our database somewhere a whole bunch of data that we took from healthy people. This is what things are supposed to happen in healthy people. Maybe it's blood, maybe it's kidney, maybe it's a piece of, of a vein so we can understand uh, cardiovascular disease, et cetera. And we've studied the, the healthy folks and that's in our, our library. And then maybe we've studied some people with a disease and that's in our library too. And so we have a patient sample. We now basically, if, if we can in you know, real time or, or weeks rather than months or years, basically do the sequencing, do the profile profiling, can we start to understand, well, what's wrong in this particular patient that, uh, from, that would distinguish them from healthy and do, do they look like other patients that we knew? And then ultimately what we'd like to get to is, oh, and not only do we see what's wrong with them, but we see, oh, this gene here looks like it's upregulated. Maybe that's the right drug to be using, right? That's sort of one of the hopes, you know, whether we get there or not will be determined in the future. And then the same um, uh, here, this is a, a slightly older paper, uh, 2017. But, you know, again, when you get into these, pe people are really well aware of this. An important hurdle is the pre-processing analysis and storage of the data. We're not going to be able to make therapeutic decisions or anything if we don't solve that problem. And so that's, a, I, th I think, really a, a grand challenge for, for us to do. So the, the way that we do it today with the bulk RNA sequencing, find the average clone. And then if we see that they have lots of, uh, you know, HER2 amplification, then we know how to treat that. With single cell, as I said, the hope is that you would then look at individual cells and potentially think of of a more precision approach to it. Well, not only do they have some cells that have this mutation, but they might have other cells that have a different mutation. And that could ideally lead you to combination therapies. Um, the challenge there, as I said before, is you, if you miss a small fraction of the cells that have an even more important location, you might wipe out a lot of the tumor, but then it just comes sort of roaring back with, with the, you haven't taken away the, the, the parts that you can control by drug, but there are still other parts of the tumor that had different mutation that were resistant or that developed resistance. And then there's, you know, uh, as I alluded to earlier, some of the pre and post treatment. So if I sequence something pre-treatment then look for, you know, even sort of circulating tumor cells post-treatment, can I understand what my treatment did? And that again is really important if we can get it right because it feeds back into B and A and says, look, you know, we, we now see that this drug has this effect. So we really want to use it in people that have a defect that, that aligns with it. All right. And then this one, uh, you know, is, is a really cool one. Uh, one of the, my new colleagues at Harvard has been working on this uh, project, SIF. Um, and here what they, they do is they basically take an image uh, from a microscopic, you know, a fixed tissue on a slide. They have a, a, a mechanism, and there are many similar ones around, as, as far as I'm aware, where you will stain the, the slide with antibodies that have fluorescent uh, uh, 
tags conjugated to them. And so you can get a color for PCNA and you get a color for beta catenin and you get a color for DNA. And so you can figure out, well, where's the DNA in, a, in the image? Where are, do we see this uh, gene PCNA expressed and where do we see beta catenin? And if you can do that for 10 or 15 different proteins, right? That's what's being detected here is proteins on mRNAs. Um, then, you know, each one gets you four colors. So now you can imagine like, okay, now I have four different images that are overlaying on each other. If I can align those, great. Now I basically, for any pixel, I have a no notion of well, what color is that pixel and what color are the neighbors of that pixel. If I can go one step further and take some of the, the, the new image processing uh, algorithms and say, well, here are all the cells in the image. Right now, what I can do, and that's sort of what you see over here in the middle two pictures, is basically I've segmented this image down to the cellular level, and I didn't do it; somebody else did, but yeah, segmented down to that. And we have an X Y position in the image for each cell. So now, what we're going to do is just go over here and translate that into a a level for that particular um, substance here. And so now what you have for each of those things is sort of like this 16 dimensional array where for each location in the image, you know something about the cell that's there. And now those are just cell-based assays, just like anything else. So now you can come out and do the sort of TISNI and UMAP plots of, of the cells, uh, thinking of them in 16 dimensional space, and then identify subsets and go back into this and say, oh, look, this, the cells that have these sorts of genes expressed, they're along the edge of these uh, of these little uh, look, look like villi of some sort. And these other ones are in the inside and they look different. And these ones at the bottom, again, look different. And we can start to really apply computational methods. The challenge here is going from a slide image to, you know, all the data that I need is, is quite a substantial amount of work. And it's not clear how I'm gonna do that, uh, you know, for a thousand slides or 10,000 slides. And then back to the, the question that I raised at the start is when we better make sure we know what we're, question we wanna answer and that we had a pathologist choose the slides for us that are the most important ones for us to answer that question because we don't wanna spend a week of somebody's time or a month of somebody's time generating data that is ultimately not gonna be useful downstream. And then as we and others do this all over the world, how do we put all these things back together into data warehouse type operations, which are sufficiently well annotated that individuals can come and reuse this data for other questions that, that we didn't have in, in mind at the time. Another one, uh, paper, you know, exactly the same story, just trying to sort of give you an example of a lot of the stuff. This is from Peter Campbell's group. Precision, precision oncology for AML is, uh, you know, basically is going to need large knowledge banks of matched genomic clinical data that support clinical decision making. So, you know, this is a problem. We we all need to, to sort of start to think about how are we going to do that because that's the one of the real roadblocks between idea and, and clinical change. So um, just getting close to the end here. So I hope what I've shown you is that there's some really interesting and potentially transformational approaches to delivering treatments and helping people understand not just, you know, real disease, but wellness and, and, and everything that affects humans as they go through life and make sure that they have as comfortable and, and productive a life as they can. Um, I hope I've convinced you that import, how important large, well-curated data sets are going to be for success, um, and that it's really essential that we start to think as a as a, a computational scientist, how do we speed that up without sacrificing quality? And then, well, I didn't talk about R at all. Hopefully, everybody saw that R, R you know, at least in my mind, R and Python and things like that are really going to be the essential building blocks under here for developing models. The one piece I didn't put here um, that probably I should have is that part of this is we really start have to start paying more attention to data technologies because as these data sets get big, we, we can't, you know, sort of rely on that, you know, somehow it just turns out okay to, to, you know, how fast can we get them off of disk? How fast can we get them to a CPU or a GPU? You know, if it takes me five minutes to do, you know, one sort of model fit in a, in a study, then I'm limited in time for how many model fits I can do. If I can get that down to 15 seconds or a millisecond, then I, you know, my ability to just explore the range of models is, is pretty, pretty different. So um, at that point, I shall stop. 
I haven't seen any interruption, so hopefully I'm not just talking to myself. No, no, not at all. And we have several questions. Um, first, um, let I'm me gonna start. I'm going to Joe, and ho so hopefully I don't get kicked out. Can you hear? Yeah. Can you see me now? Yes. All right. Perfect. All right. So uh, you, you've outlined a, a future, and in the recent future, maybe 20 years, where there's going to be a tremendous amount of technical knowledge available, uh, scientific knowledge and technical know-how. And this is going to impact, um, you know, systems like the practice of medicine, uh, public health, uh, complex systems that interact and are very slow to change. Um, what, can you give any advice to how like the physicians listening here or maybe public health officials, what they need to be doing to prepare for this? How can they help change? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's about, you know, the, the place where people can help is to take their specialty. So if you're a clinician, then what's the problem? Are there problems that you can identify that you say, hey, you know, if we had a tool that sort of solved this part of the diagnosis or solved this part of my, you know, sort of clinical care of somebody, I could see more people or I could do better or here's, you know, we're using this and I don't think it works very well, right? It's, it's identifying, you know, clinicians should be able to really help us identify the, the opportunities and then as things come along to basically be willing to get involved in the clinical sort of trial part, like like how do we get it out into practice, right? And then for public health, it's I think a very similar uh, role is like, given what I know, what, you know, what are the problems that I think this will help me solve, right? Okay, so, so looking into the future again in clinical practice and its place with artificial intelligence and machine learning, what's the outlook for specialties such as pathology and radiology? You know, once they provide enough cases for the models uh, to make cor correct predictions, uh, do you think it, that um, it'll reduce the need for the number of physicians in the workforce in, the, in that area? So, so far that has never turned out to be true. Um, when I get asked this question, I always tell a story about when I was an undergraduate in, in the math department and the, one week all of the, the women that were employed as, as typists for, and at that time it turned out what it was, I think exclusively women, they, they were very unhappy because there was this great new thing called a word processor that came along and suddenly, you know, the word processor was going to make it so instead of four people typing manus manuscripts, we were down to one person typing manuscripts, right? And so they were very worried about their jobs. And, you know, everybody knows what happened. We didn't reduce the workforce. We just changed what the workforce did. You know, mathematicians used to never revise their papers. They would use white out and handwrite in a little bit, right? But the type version was a bit now what they did. What they did then was they basically went for real revisions. And so, you know, the same thing I believe is going to happen with pathology. We're going to take the, the sort of boring common cases, which you know, if I was a pathologist and things came along that could be read by a machine, I'm personally, I would be very happy if they could be read by the machine so that I could spend my time working on the problems that are really hard, right? That's, that's how you get innovation into the, in, into medicine. You take away the problems that are easy and put your skilled workforce on the problems that are hard. So, um, do you think, how do you think you could, uh, persuade MDs to act on, say, algorithm without a without a random controlled trial, you know, versus standard of care. I'm not sure I want to. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm I'm a pretty big fan of random con randomized controlled trials. I mean, I think that's how we've managed to push stuff forward, and I really haven't seen. Um, any examples that that have convinced me that there is there are better ways i mean there are better ways to run clinical trials that i will admit to but randomized controlled clinical trials are you know i think an essential piece going forward so do you think if that if a wearable um iot medical sensor data was scored to a sufficient statistic a data stream uh, the data reduction would make wearable sensors sensors useful in gathering environmental data. 
Well, they could. You know, there was a bunch of stuff uh, that that I'd seen must be almost 10 years ago now of these sort of silicon bands that people could wear um, that basically just picked up environmental exposures. And then at, at some regular interval, every three months or something, you took it off and sent it in and, and ran through a mass spec. So if you wanted that kind of stuff, um, you know, what we find at or what, what we found at 23andMe when I was there is that, you know, just using zip codes and things like that for where people live gives you a reasonable idea of what exposure is. You know, I think some of the concern around these wearables about, you know, we're not trying to get, I don't think, exact values all the time. Sometimes it's just you need to be reasonably close and so that when you average it out over a decade, you, you know, you have a number that's interpretable and then not to worry about, did I get exactly the right number of steps that, that you walk today? Um, and, and the big changes are not going to be you know, about that, it's going to be, you know, if you suddenly change how much you, how active you are by some amount, right, then that's a big change. And maybe that associates with, you know, a, a healthier lifestyle. And, you know, at least from that Apple Watch and folks can see I, I have one. When you do that, you, you also get heart rate. And if, you know, changing your walking changes your heart rate, right, we sort of get these two readouts at once. Um, if I want to know how fit somebody is, you know, I keep saying the, the best thing in the world would be to make them climb 10 flights of stairs, measure their heart rate at the start, measure it at the end, and how long it takes it to go back to where it was at the start. And it's going to be better than anything else. Um, and, and the watch doesn't need to be that accurate to get that about right. I think we're at times over, uh, you know, sensitive to accuracy. Um. How do you think we can tackle the problem of uh, well curated data? Do you think R could be a driver in data engineering? I don't know if R is the, I mean, the way we tackle it, right? I mean, it's it's getting ontologies, getting, you know, people to come close to agreeing on a set of words to apply to things and what things are synonym, synonyms to each other. You know, again, I, I think it's, let, let's not try to say here's the one way of describing everything, but let's try to get reasonably close so that individuals can find the things that are close to what they want. And then if they need to recurate them individually with their own pathologist uh, next to them, that that's what you should do. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's very hard to, to, you know, I, I don't think you could some, come up with a thing that said, okay, all the clinical pathologists in the world have to agree that this slide has this evidence for this disease, like they just won't. Um, not and not because the, the, any of them are wrong. It's just not how how they think about things. And so it's it's better to have reasonable ways of annotating and then ways of mapping between the annotations. Do you know if anyone has tried to present pharmacogenetic data in the EMR text at point of care to MDs prescribing specific meds? I mean. The person says it seems likely the huge interface problem as geneticists and statisticians use very different jargon. MDs want prospective data, preferably RCTs. Is there a quality of the data enough to affect care? Well, certainly if if what you're at, so to find you two things, if you're hopefully we're on, on the same. So in the one case for something like G6PD that I showed, if you have a mutation for that, there, it's there is a you know, pretty standard way of pointing that out, and it would be good for you to know if you had that mutation, um, because as I said, there are certain drugs that you really shouldn't take, and there are certain foods that you really shouldn't eat. Um, and, and if you do, it, it can be life-threatening, and so that's pretty straightforward. For a lot of the CYP genes and other genes that we know metabolize drugs quite differently, what happens today is if a doctor wants to prescribe those in general, they, they sort of have two approaches. They start low and titrate up, or they get you tested um, and then try to narrow in on the dosage that way. So, you know, there is a standard of reporting genetic uh, evidence. Um, I, I don't think it's a big, big problem. I mean, around PRSs, it'll be more interesting, right? And that's largely the problem. How do we convey to a doctor the right idea of risk, right? And that's not gonna come from statisticians, but right, that's gonna come from people that do UX design that understand how to write words that help people understand risk and through changes in training in medical schools. So the clinicians are you know, able to understand what's being told to them around 
the genetics and the genetics of risk. So uh, to close out here, um, do you have any thoughts about the ethical considerations that, um, you know, go along with all the technology and knowledge that you're anticipating? Yeah, to, <laughs> you have to pay a great deal of attention. Um, you know, you need to, to, you know, get people who are consented for the work that you want to do. Uh, you know, at, again, my experience at 23andMe was that most people that have diseases want to be involved in how we solve and, and make those better. And, and, you know, nobody who has, uh, you know, there's virtually no disease with, you know, that is well handled for every human, right? It's, there's, there's a lot of room for improvement and the population wants to be more involved than it is in medicine. So I think there's huge opportunities there, but the ethics are the, the ones of like making sure that you uh, have consent I think there are ethics that are, are, you know, right now not being well observed, which is we don't do enough diversity. And so if we focus our attention too much on European populations, which is sort of where the genetics world has ended up in part because of, you know, access to, to samples and, and data, you know, it's important that we start to branch out and make sure that we cover, uh, you know, a broader range of the population. And then it's important that we, you know, bring in good statistical methods to make sure that what we're saying is applicable to the individuals that we intend to, to be treated. Um, you know, I think that the piece at the, the very start, uh, you know, where I tried to say, you know, for reasons I don't understand, um, you know, machine learning algorithms seem to be getting set up by people who, you know, it doesn't matter what the input is, they're going to give you an answer. Um, and, you uh, Folks that have read Brian Ripley's book uh, on this, you know, one of the best things that you can do is to say, I didn't ever see a data piece like that. And so I'm not going to make a prediction. <laughs> well, thank you, Robert. Our time has come to an end. Um, you've covered an extraordinary amount of material, and I'm sure we're going to be thinking about it all till the next Our Medicine Conference. And um, we're very fortunate to have you here, and we, we all wish you the best in your new position. Thank you. Thanks. So now, I guess, there's a break on the agenda.